As I light this yellow candle, I vow never to forget the lives of the Jewish men, women, and children who are symbolized by this flame. They were tortured and brutalized by human beings who acted like beasts. Their lives were taken in cruelty. May we be inspired to learn more about our six million brothers and sisters as individuals and as communities, to recall their memory throughout the year so that they will not suffer a double death. May we recall not only the terror of their deaths, but also the splendor of their lives. May the memory of their lives inspire us to hallow our own lives and to live meaningful Jewish lives so that we may help to ensure that part of who they were shall always endure. Amen. Seen before you is my grandfather, Leon Cooper. I call him Zadie which is the Yiddish term for grandfather. My Zadie lived in Poland during World War II and survived the Holocaust. This documentary is in honor of him to commemorate his story. Many survivors don't like talking about their stories, but my Zadie is always willing to share his experiences and his life. I interviewed him on Yom HaShoah, the Holocaust Remembrance Day. This is his story. Uh, this is Leon Cooper. I live in Houston, Texas. I'm a Holocaust survivor. And I'm also mostly proud to be Noam Saper's grandfather. <laughs> We lived in a town called Khorzhov, which was in Silesia, right on the, uh, on the German border. And uh, my early childhood was, uh, was, wasn't very exciting. It was very normal. I went to school, and after school we played ball, and, and then after that we went to Hebrew school. Uh, and that lasted the that lasted until 1939. In 1939, people started talking about a war with Germany because the place we lived used to belong to Germany before the First World War, and now, now if they take it over, then it's going to be part of Germany again. And sure enough, on September 1st, 1939, the Germans invaded Poland and within a few days uh, took over the whole country. That started our life as refugees in a town called Jaloshitsa. The town had about 8,000 people, and they swelled with refugees like us, about 12,000. We were very cramped. People had to give up rooms. Uh, they put many families into apartments. It all depends how big the apartment is, how many people are going to live there. Uh, there, was, there was no work. Everybody just roaming around the streets, and there was no, not too much food. We still were able to buy food from the farmers that came up to the, to the city. That lasted in 1942. And in 1942, again, there was rumors that the Germans would build huge camps, war camps, in eastern Poland, and eventually we'll ship all the Jews there. So we woke up <clears> the <throat> night, September the 3rd, 1942. The whole town was surrounded by Germans and Poles and Ukrainians. There was like a human cha chain, and uh, we were told to get out on the market square with food for three days and uh, one suitcase. At first, we had a little hiding room on the attic, which was good for little actions, as we call them when the Germans would come in with trucks and haul people off the street, mostly men, to take them to work in. So uh, after a while, when the shootings were going on, still going on, and the dogs were barking, we, we felt that this was the room of Corey, so we came down to the market square and reported. If you can imagine a place like maybe three football fields with uh, 
with men and women and children. It was hot. It was September, but it was still hot. I remember the day vividly. We uh, had to, I had an overcoat with me, I had an empty pair of pants and, and underwear because we knew we were not going to be able to go to our apartments again. So you knew, you basically knew what was coming. We knew we were going to be transported to war camps. Mm-hmm. But not to, not to extermination camps, not killed. Yeah. It just worked the fields. Mm-hmm. You transported. Where I was transported, we were taken on the trains to uh, to, to go east. They took us first. They took us to a little town about ten miles away called Miachov, and the next day they combined the Jews from both towns, and they put us on uh, on a train, which was heading east. Uh, we landed in a city called Krakow, which was in southern Poland. Before we went on the train, we were separated, the men from the women and the children. The women and children went to the left, and the men went to the right. Uh, my mother and, and my two sisters got taken to the left, and uh, my father and I were landed on the right. Everything happened so fast. This is the last time I've seen my mother and my two sisters. What do you, at the time, what did you think happened to them? What, at that time I didn't know, but after the war we did, went, did find out what happened. They were taken uh, to a, uh, uh, after we stopped in Krakow, and they let us, uh, let us off. The rest of the train they took to a place called Belgius, spelled B-E-L-Z-E-C, which was in southern Poland, and uh, there they were killed within hours after they got there. Mm-hmm. We know that from books. There was not too many. They, they were taken to Belgium, and there was not too many people that uh, survived. As far as I know, there was about two people who survived. There was 800,000 people killed in that one camp. Wow. So where did you go next? You were you were separated from your mother and your sisters. Okay, we were taken to a camp, war camp in Prashov, what in Krakow. What we were doing, we were uh, we were uh, labor, slave labor. Uh, we were working and and laying irrigation system through the city of Krakow. It was done by a German firm who who uh, was employing all the Jews and giving the Germans money for our work. Well, what were the conditions like? And the working conditions were very bad. We didn't have any equipment, uh, so we had the shovel, picks and shovels, we had to we had to go ahead and dig big ditches to put the pipes in, and uh, and then cover them up. And so we have, like I said, shovels and picks, and uh, it work was very hard. Uh, what about the living conditions? Oh, living conditions. Okay, there's a uh, we slept in barracks, uh, three high. It wasn't really in bunks. It wasn't really bunks. It was just like maybe shelves in uh, in the in like a, in a store in a discount house, and uh, very crowded. Uh, no toilets. Toilets were outside, outhouses, and no no running water. Food was very meager. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know now you were moved from Krakow and you went somewhere else to a place called Plashow. Uh Can you tell me about this? The Plashow was formed in, in the beginning of 1943. This was this was in Krakow, which was well, Plashow was too, but it was not on the premises. They took us. They took us to Plashow to build. Uh, to build barracks and living living uh, places. So after that, we were taken into Prashov 
into the camp. And the Pasha was worse than the ones before, because there were more people and less food, and lots, lots of work. Okay, so um, at Plashav, uh, what is like your most memorable event? What I remember most? Well, in Plashav, my father got killed. Now the way the way they were killed is that he was working with a group of people outside the premises of Pashov. And they were going, in the morning, they were going out with a guard, and, and work, they worked in the factory, and at night they were coming back into the camp. So one morning, one night, as they were coming in, they got stopped at the gate, and um, they got searched, and they found that some people bought some bread and butter from the, from the poles, which uh, wasn't permissible. And uh, they called the guy Get, Amnon Get, which was the camp commander, very brutal. And uh, she says, he ordered them all to get killed. So within a minute, they surrounded them and they shut them down. Wow. Um, so, um... I know you had experiences with Oscar Schindler, so can you just speak about them and what happened? Okay, I'll tell you how it happened with Oscar Schindler. I'll back up a little bit. Yeah. Now, Oscar Schindler uh, was a German who bought a Jewish factory, and he was uh, and he was uh, employing the Jews from Krakow into his factory. And then when what when it happened when it was and then, yeah, and then he was a buddy of Amnon Gat. He was his frequent guest in Villa. Uh, they both uh, ate and drank together. So Schindler decided to go ahead and build and build an, a little camp right next to the factory because he had trouble getting the people. Yeah, before um, I got back for a minute. There was uh, his people were coming from the ghetto in Krakow, but then the, the ghetto was eliminated. So his people were taken to Pashov and going to work every morning and coming back from Pashov. So uh, having a pots and pans factory, although he he serviced mostly the army, was made made pots for the German army. He felt that uh, having this pots and pans is not a big enough uh, national treasure, national uh, to to be to warrant to have people. So he, he that's when he decided to build a camp right there next door. So that this when I came in, they took about 1,000 people from Pashov into Schindler's camp, and what we were doing, we we're building a factory right next to the pots and pans factory. And what was this uh, new factory supposed to make? The new, uh, new factory was supposed, was supposed to make bullets for the Germans, but then the factory was never finished. Okay. So how, how did living and working for Oscar Schindler help you? How, how long? Yeah, how long? Well, I was there almost a year in in a Schindler place. And Schindler, going back to Schindler, Schindler was buying extra food with his own money for the Jews in the camps. And he also and um, he also was walking around into the camp. People were not scared of him like they were of, of, of Get. Because if you saw Get coming up at you, it was there was bad news already. He saw Schindler coming up to, to you. Uh, somebody stopped and he asked you, a small talk. You got enough to eat and you're working hard and so on. We, you felt kind of safe from Schindler. Mm -hmm. So you felt like you felt like he was more of, he cared about you. Yeah, he cared about you, right, exactly. Now, now why, we don't know. Hmm. 
So what happened after Schindler? Talking about what? What happened after Schindler's factory? What happened after Schindler? That takes us to, to the fall of 1944. At that time, the, uh, the Russians were moving forward and the Germans were retreating. So we got orders to liquidate Schindler's camp and Plashov. And uh, so Schindler left about 300 people to pack all the equipment, and the rest of us were sent back to Plashov, to the big camp. When we got there, the whole place was like on fire, because what the Germans were doing is they were, there was no crematoria in Plashov, so everybody got killed, was buried in the ground. So now, now they had to dig up the, the bodies and burn them so there won't be no, any evidence of what they did. They were trying to make it like it never happened. Right. Okay. So, so, so afterwards, Schindler brought his people into Plashov, and then he decided to buy another factory in Czechoslovakia. But we, the, uh, the thousand people or so, uh, were already beyond, beyond uh, the return. We got shipped to Germany within days after we got there. So now he had to get new people to go with him. That's why they made a list of people who go with them, and that's why they call it Schindler's List. That is I was not in Sch on Schindler's List per se. My name isn't on the list. But the um, uh, I was in, Sch in fact longer than the people on the list. Mm -hmm. So the camp was li liquidated and you were sent to Germany? Correct. So where were you sent? Like in Germany, they took us to a place called Dresden, which was a f not a factory. And what we did, we slept on the top floor of the factory. Then we worked on the bottom floor. So was, there was a guard in on the stairway and on the staircase. And this was like the like the border. So in the morning you go downstairs, and in the evening you go upstairs. It was just like in jail. Uh, there was no, uh, we couldn't get out. Uh, you were inside all the time. But the good part of it was, this was already cold in winter time, and we were already, you know, malnourished. And uh, our our clothes was was already in rags. So it was kind of nice to be working inside. The bomb? Yeah. Okay, then we, I got sick with typhus. And typhus is a disease you get from, from lice. It's usually fatal, you get high fever. And uh, Lucky was, was, was with me again. I was, uh, we got orders to ship out. I felt a little better already, so they didn't kill me. And uh, I, we got orders to ship out, and they shipped us to Czechoslovakia. In Czechoslovakia, I was still sick, but lucky for me, there was more pr people within work to be done. So after the morning count, I was kind of wasted away and half asleep. And uh, my friend held me up for, for the count, so I'd be counted. Uh, so that lasted until 1945. Then one day, as we were, we were at the assembly in formation, we were told all the Jews to step out. So we, they took us to Theresienstadt. Theresien was a ghetto in Czechoslovakia. It was like a model ghetto to which the Germans brought in all the uh, dignitaries from different cities, from different countries, to show them how the Jews lived. And there they, they, were, working, they were wearing civilian clothes, they had cafes, they had movies, soccer fields. And what they show is what they show you they didn't show you that the Resenstadt was also a way station for Auschwitz, where they were picking up the Jews 
and the in throughout the country, bringing to Dresden and then shipping on transports to Auschwitz. Now the plan was to get us all killed. Mind you, this is already the the uh, end of the war. End of the war, and they still want to accomplish what they started to kill the Jews. But the king commander in Dresden saw the handwriting on the wall. And he surrendered the camp with the prisoners to the Red Cross. So the Red Cross flags were flying over the, the new city. So, at, so then when we got there, we, uh, the people were lined the streets and they were crying at the site. We, we, when they saw us, we, we got taken in and uh, we were given showers. First time we had a shower and, and Two, three years. So it was a nice treatment there. My treatment? Uh, I, I, I was taken to a hospital over there in the uh, gray area. I, I don't remember exactly the procedure, but I know I woke up and but I was taken to the hospital. First of all, they showered us and uh, kind of held us up while underwater because we were so weak. And then they put me in the hospital and after a few days. I survived. Okay, so what? When was the official liberation of uh, Theresian Sad? Well, a few days later, the Russians came in officially to mark May the ninth, 1945. Some camps were were, were liberated in in fifth of May, uh, but we were on the eighth of May. Okay. So, um, what happened? It really, it really didn't make much difference because we were already under the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what happened after you were liberated? Well, after we liberated, it really hit us hard because up to then, we hoped that our families were still alive because we didn't know anything about the camps and we were hoping that... Uh, they were in, in the camp which wasn't as bad as ours. How can you imagine a, a, a country like Germany would go ahead and kill women and children uh, just for the heck of it? So you were hoping for the best? I was hoping to what? You were hoping was, that... My family would come back, right? Yes, okay. And then, and then we found out about the, all the different, different camps, the... Uh, extermination camps like Belgium, and Auschwitz, Treblinka, Majdanek, and so on. Okay, so um, you were sent to America soon. Talk about that. Before... Well, the, well after, after we liberated, we didn't want to go back to Poland because we, we knew already that uh, our families are dead and uh, the Poles were not too uh, too cooperative with the Jews. In fact, they kind of helped the Germans to, to pick up the Jews from the, from the, from the streets and cities. Uh, so then there was a... Uh, people were going back to different, different countries, friends, and... Uh, and uh, and so there was a chance to come to the United States, and there was it was a group of uh, people of young youngsters, under 21, and uh, they they sent us to New York. And so you reached New York. After we reached New York, they took us. Uh, they uh, we spent the day in New York, and then they sent us to Cleveland, Ohio because they want to keep New York open. We were there under the auspices of the joint, the Jewish, uh, Jewish, Jewish uh, uh, Federation. Uh, so they want to keep New York open for future immigrants. So they sent us to Cleveland, Ohio. And from there, they sent us all over the country. In Cleveland, they called up different cities and said, we've got a couple of youngsters over here. Can you sponsor them? By sponsoring me, you got to give us a place to, to live, and uh, so we won't be a b burden to the society. 
so there was uh, the sentence in Paris, so we can go ahead and talk to each other because we didn't know how to speak English then. So uh, they took a, they tried to Paris, you know. So there was another guy named Mo Finkelman and me, they paired together, and they told us, would you like to go to Texas, Houston? He said, where is Houston? So they showed us on the map where Houston was, and they told us there's cowboys down there. <laughs> so we've been there. So we've been there since 19, uh, 1946. We still haven't seen any cowboys. No cowboys. No cowboys. So, when you got That's to Houston, where huh? were you? Where were you living in Houston? Where, oh, where I was living, and when we first got there, first got there, they put us in like an orphanage. Really, it wasn't an orphanage, so it was a house. It used to be an orphanage, but there wasn't too many orphans. It was a house for broken families, uh, the kids of broken families. So, like a divorce, or uh, one, one of the parents died, uh, they would take care of the kids. Okay. Then I went to school and uh, to learn the language. And, uh, after that, I graduated from high school, and I uh, got a job, and uh, everything was fine. And then the Korean War broke out, and I got drafted to the army. So, and then I was shipped back to Germany. So, a few years after I left Germany, I was back over there. At this time, I was in the American uniform. Um. So, how did you feel being shipped back to Germany? Well, really, really, I didn't feel too bad. At that time, I felt good about it because it's not Germany, it was going to Korea. And going to Korea, you get sh shot at. You get shot at, you might die. Mm -hmm. So, in a, in a way, we were safer in Germany. So, in America today, have you, feel, have, have you felt like you've been able to like, spread your story? You mean my story? Well, there's, there's, there's lots of stories. Everybody has, a different, has got a different story. You know, we have about 300 survivors in Houston. We've got 300 uh, different stories of survival. Everybody had a little, little different twist. Mm -hmm. And how have you yeah, been... I'm not, I'm not looking to, buy, to write in another book. There's, there's, there's too many books already written about that. So... Other than writing a book, how have you been able, how have you done it? How have you? Well, we, what I was doing personally, and with a group from Houston of survivors, we formed a group called um, Houston Council of Jewish Holocaust Survivors. And, uh, and we had a, we were going out to schools and churches and synagogues and tell them about our experiences. So you do like... You speak at schools and... You're right, you're right. Like we go to schools and sometimes we have like the whole ninth grade, the whole junior, junior high school. I mean, I spoke for, for kids, about a thousand of them, in the gym. And they uh, were all very receptive and they're very surprised because they haven't heard much about the Holocaust. And so, what they heard sometimes is denial. So this is one thing, another thing, denial of the Holocaust. Now it became almost, you know, it got their own name. The people say that the Holocaust never happened. It's just a lot of propaganda for the Jews. That's why we feel that it's very important that as long as we can talk, to go ahead and, uh, and tell the people about the Holocaust. I myself, just last week, I spoke to a group of people in the old folks home, and the average age was about 95. So we... We don't care how old they are and how many they are. It's still important we, to spread the story. We expect, yeah, you know, we want to tell them what happened. Yep, and so let's uh, conclude, I think, but I have one more question. Okay. If, if you had any message about the Holocaust that you would give to anyone, groups, kids of children, anyone, what would you say to them? What, was the what would the message be? Well, there's one word, it's called tolerance. 
you got to tolerate you human being, you fellow human being. Uh, we all we all equal. One isn't better than the other one. And we all got to remember that everybody wants to be treated nicely. So and something else, get involved. Don't be a bystander. Because this what happened in the Second World War. There were too many bystanders. Nobody wants to get mixed up, nobody wants to get involved. You get involved for the right cause. Thank you.